Hi. You're a nurse. You've worked for many years in hospitals. You worked on intensive care units in life and death situations. You've seen people die. At some point, you decided to do a study into near-death experiences. How did it come to this? Well, my first interest really began quite early on in my intensive care career. And it was during a night shift and I was looking after a man who was clearly dying. And I went about my usual routine and I was gonna wash this man. And I can remember adjusting the bed, pressing the, the button, it was an electric bed. And as the bed started to move, the man nearly jumped out of bed in agony. He was in so much pain. And at that point, our eyes connected and it's, it's almost as if I felt like I swapped places with him and I could feel like what he was going through. And he couldn't talk because he was ventilated and he had a tracheostomy, but he was mouthing the words for me, leave me die, let me die, just let me die in peace. And that had a huge effect on me. And the only thing I could do was to call the doctor who increased his painkillers but it had very little effect. And so what I found to be most effective was just to pull the screens around and to sit with the man and hold his hand. And then when he started to calm down, I washed the parts of his body that I could reach and he just eventually went off to sleep. But that had such an effect on me that I was thinking about it for the rest of the shift. That's all I could think about. And then when my shift ended the following morning, I went home and I couldn't sleep. It was really upsetting to me. And so I phoned work mid-morning to find out how the man was doing. And my colleague told me that he died two hours after I'd finished my shift. And so that was the really, really the starting point. So I started reading about death and there were no courses at the, at the time that uh, were suitable to help me to care for dying patients in a critical care area. All of the courses were just palliative care, which has a very different approach. So then when I started reading about death, I came across near-death experiences. And I thought, no, this is really quite interesting because patients who have died temporarily have come back to life and said that death is a wonderful experience. And I think because my nurse training had been so scientific, I was initially very skeptical. But the more I read about these experiences, the more curious I became. And I thought, well, you know, I'm working in the perfect place where I can research these. And so that's what I did. I applied to do some research, wrote a research proposal, and my research went from there. And doing my research, has literally changed my life. It's changed my worldview, it's changed everything. And so it, for me, I think it's been a very empowering thing. And I think that when we start to learn about death, that's when we really start to learn about life. When did you do this research? Well, I started the pilot study was in the, year, the summer of 1997. And then I started the actual research in January 1998. And I completed the data collection in January 2003. So it took five years to gather the data. And it took a further three years to actually analyse the data and write it up. What did you do? Um what did you try to find out? Well, what I did for the first year of the research, I wanted to interview everyone who had been a patient in intensive care. And that was regardless of if they'd come close to death or not. I wanted to make sure that I didn't let any kind of patients slip through the net, as, so to speak. So for the first year, every single person who survived their admission to ITU, I interviewed. And when I approached them, what I said to them was, do you have any recollection of the time that you were unconscious? Now, most patients didn't remember anything at all, and that was as far as the interview got. But there were a few people who said, oh, well, why are you asking? So I said, I'm just curious in people's experiences. And then some people started to open up and describe unusual experiences. And so at that point, I then, um, asked if I could interview them in depth and I went back at, um, at a slightly later time and I, I conducted an in-depth interview with them then. Mm -hmm. How long were these studies? Uh, in total then it was for five years and what I found after the first year it was a lot of work because I was doing it all in my spare time. So I had to come in and interview the patients before my shift began. And I had to stay behind after the shift to also interview patients. And sometimes I'd come in on my day off. Mm 
And so what I realised, I couldn't sustain that for five years because I was spending more time in hospital than I was at home. So after the first year, I modified the data. And what I did then, I just interviewed patients who had undergone cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. So they'd been clinically dead for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And what I found, there was a great difference actually between the, the samples. And so the, for the first year, out of 243 patients, only two of them reported a near-death experience. And those were people that lost consciousness? Yes, they had. On the way to hospital or during hospital? Or during hospital stay, mm -hmm. yes. And woke up again? That's right. Mm -hmm. And then when I focused then on patients who'd had a near-death experience, the sample was much smaller. There were 39 patients in that sample, but out of those, seven people reported a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. So my research kind of showed that the closer one comes to death, the more likely they are to report a near-death experience. And more so who had a cardiac arrest? Yes, those who had the cardiac arrest mm -hmm. uh, were more likely to report a near-death experience. How many people with cardiac arrest did you interview? There were, over that five years, there were 39 patients who had a cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. Yes. And of those, how much had a near-death experience? Out of those, there were seven who had the near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And then the total sample in the five years, because what I found is when I was just focusing on the cardiac arrest group, some of my colleagues would say to me, oh, a patient reported something unusual. I think you, sh you should go and talk to that patient. So some people then reported a near-death experience that wasn't in the context of a, um, a cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. So I also included those in the overall sample then. Mm -hmm. So in total, during the five-year uh, five data collection, there were 15 patients who reported a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And out of those, eight patients reported the out-of-body component as well. Mm -hmm. And with the out-of-body component, I was really interested to see if I could verify if what they were reporting was correct. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I, I hid um, symbols on top of the cardiac monitors, which were situated at the bedside of each of the patients. And these monitors were above head height and they were uh, the targets that I put on top of the monitors were concealed behind ridges. So the only way anyone could have viewed what was on top of that monitor was if they had left their body. Mm -hmm. And these targets were mounted on very bright coloured card to attract attention. So if anyone was out of their body, they'd be more likely to see the card. Mm -hmm. Now what I found at the end of that eight years was, uh, five years, sorry, is that although eight people reported the out-of-body experience, no one actually saw those hidden targets. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason for this was very variable, really. So that was quite interesting in itself, because what I found was that some of the patients floated in directions opposite to where the, t the targets were situated. Some of them didn't rise high enough out of their body. So some of them were just a few foot above their bed, looking down on their bodies. But there were two patients who would have been in a position where they could have viewed those symbols. And what I found with those, both of those patients said, I was so interested in looking at my body, I wasn't looking around for hidden symbols. Yes. And one man in particular said to me, if you'd have told me that there was a hidden symbol there, I would have gone and looked for it and I could have come back and told you what it was. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any other striking reports? Um, probably the strongest case in my research was the case of patient 10 and I've published that in the Journal of Near-Death Studies and this is a patient that um, very accurately reported the actions of the nurse, the doctor and the physiotherapist and I know what he reported was accurate because I was actually the nurse looking after him at the time. Mm -hmm. Now this man had um, been in intensive care for a few weeks, he was recovering and because he, he was still ventilated but the idea was to sit him into the chair to help with his breathing and to help with his muscle tone and to help with his posture. So we'd sat him in the chair this morning, in that morning and I noticed that when we'd sat him in the chair his blood pressure had started to fall, his breathing pattern changed and then he started to look grey and clammy and I thought if we didn't get him into bed very quickly he could have a cardiac arrest in the chair. So I called my colleagues, we put him into the bed 
and the doctor came to review him. Uh, the doctor was busy with another emergency, but he very quickly came, examined the patient, prescribed some fluid to help his blood pressure, and then the, the doctor went off. And then about shortly after the doctor left the bedside, the patient's blood pressure started to drop again. So I went off in search of another doctor, and at that point the consultant came into the unit for the first time that morning. And so he came and he examined the patient, and he shone a pupil torch in his eyes to check that his pupils were reacting. This patient was deeply unconscious at that point. He wasn't responding to deep painful stimuli, he was just completely unconscious. So the doctor then gave him some more fluid, which settled his blood pressure, brought that back up. And then after about half an hour, the patient started to flicker his eyelids and move his limbs. And these are all signs that he was regaining neurological function. So the doctor, the consultant was very happy with his, the condition was improving. So he went back to his office. And then after about four hours later, the, the ward round approached the bedside and there were about 10 people on that ward round, there were doctors, there were physiotherapists, the pharmacists, um, the nutritionists, so there were a lot of the, the nurses. And the patient started to become very animated and excited and he was trying to communicate something. So the physiotherapist gave him a letter board and he spelled, I died and I watched it all from above. Mm -hmm. And so the consultant said, well, you better tell Penny about that then. So the consultant actually took notice of what the patient said and he documented in the patient's notes that the patient regained full consciousness and described a near-death experience. Now when I interviewed the patient in depth, he actually described um, me cleaning his mouth, which is exactly what I did. First of all, I applied some suction to clean out his mouth when his um, condition was more stable. I dipped a sponge into water, a pink sponge, and I put that into his mouth to clean his mouth. And he also described which consultant, the doctor, who had examined him. And although he hadn't seen this doctor before he lost consciousness, he correctly identified him. And he also described the physiotherapist looking very nervous, poking a head around the curtains to check on his condition. And that was completely accurate. But the patient, during the time that that physiotherapist was looking around the curtains, that patient was completely unconscious and his eyes were closed yet he very accurately described those actions. Mm -hmm. But further to this, he also said that he went upwards into a pink room, and in that pink room was his dead father. There was a lady who he'd never met, but it was his dead mother-in-law. He recognised her from photographs. And there was also a man, and he said, I'm not sure who this man was, but he might have been Jesus. But it's not what I expect Jesus to look like because his hair was long and scruffy and it needed to, to be combed. But he said his eyes were very piercing and I was drawn to look at this Jesus type figure, his eyes. And um, he said I was very happy where I was. All my pain had disappeared and I just wanted to stay there. But this Jesus type figure, he said, no, it's not your time. You have to go back. And as soon as that he said that, he said everything, he floated backwards and that image faded in front of his eyes and all of a sudden he was back in his body. But he said, as soon as I was back in my body, I was in really bad pain and the pain was so bad that I wished that I had died. And um, further to this as well, this man um, misinterpreted one of my questions. And my question was, when you were out of your body, was there anything that you could do that you can't normally do. Now what I was getting at is that some people think of a location for example and find themselves at that location. But this man in misinterpreted the question and he said, oh yeah, look, I can open out my hand like this. Now at the time I didn't realize the significance of this, but this man has cerebral palsy. So he was 60 years of age at the time of his experience. So his hand had always been in a, a contracted position like that. But after the experience, he's now able to open out his hand fully. So when I discussed this with the doctors and the physiotherapists, 
they couldn't understand how that would be possible physiologically because his tendons would be in a permanently contracted position. So in order to open out his hand, those tendons, he'd have to undergo some surgery to release the tendons, but no such surgery was undertaken. So afterwards, actually, his hand was better. Yes, he was able to open out his hand. So, you know, that is incredible and that's something that we can't understand. And so I actually looked at his notes to check had he had hand physiotherapy, but actually, no, he hadn't. There was nothing in his notes to say he'd had any treatment on his hand at all. Mm -hmm. And um, his, when I discussed this with his sister as well, she has signed a statement to say that he has never been able to open out his hand fully like that. It is only since his experience. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, in itself is of great interest to me because if we understood the mechanism of that, mm -hmm. how many other patients have similar sort of ailments that might be treatable through by not having surgery? You know, there's, there's lots of things that we can explore by this. So I'm really excited about the possibilities of what we can learn from these kind of experiences. Mm. So what was the overall conclusion of all this? Well, what I found with my study was certainly near-death experiences, it, they happen and they're very real to the patients who have them and they have long-lasting effects as well. And you know that we can learn such a great deal from these experiences and I think we can learn so much that we can apply in our own lives without having to come close to death ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I found doing my research has been very empowering for me because mm -hmm. it's, it's made me reflect on my own mortality and it's made me consider things from a whole different perspective as well. So in what way? Well, I think the reason that we don't kind of understand near-death experiences at the moment is because our science has always considered consciousness to be a byproduct of the brain. And so these experiences don't seem then they're not explicable from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think if we look at consciousness from a different perspective, what if consciousness isn't a, a byproduct of the brain or created by the brain? What if the brain mediates consciousness rather than produces it? So that gives us a whole different perspective. What if consciousness is primary and that the brain actually mediates the consciousness and acts like a kind of a filter? So this isn't a new idea, you know, these ideas have been, William James had that idea in 1901, um, Aldous Huxley, Henri Bergson, you know, they've all, these ideas just have never been kind of explored further or investigated further. So what if the brain acts like a kind of filter and this consciousness is around us at all times and there are certain times in our life where that filter action R relaxes and allows this heightened state of consciousness into the everyday experience of these people. And I think that seems to be make more sense when we're looking at near-death experiences. Maybe something happens in that brain filter that allows this experience to be experienced rather than creates that experience. And since that study, have you done more research? Yeah, well, I, con I continue to do my research and I still gather cases of near-death experiences. And what I'm really interested in at the moment is the transformational aspects, how people are so changed by their near-death experience that they live their life in a very different way. And some people in particular are highly motivated to live their life not for themselves anymore, but more about the greater good of mankind. Why is that? Uh, I don't know, it changes, and I guess those feelings as well, I can identify with that because that's one of the ways in which I was changed by my research. I found my, my life, I'm no longer the center of my life, it's more about the bigger picture. And it's made me think in a wider perspective about the planet as well and, and how our behavior is affecting the planet. And um, I, I've gathered some cases of people who've had these transformational experiences and I've, I've just recently written a book with my co-author Kelly Walsh and the book is called The Transformative Power of Near-Death Experiences mm -hmm. and in fact the book has been very much driven by Kelly. Kelly had an experience in 2009 and that has changed her life in a very positive way and Kelly has um, set up a whole charity called the Love Care Share Foundation and that charity is about making a difference in the lives of children 
empowering children and she's devised a cartoon character for young children to be empowered by a positivity princess and who goes to planet Positavia. So it teaches children from a young age about positivity. And um, she's very passionate about what she does in her life. She's, in fact, she doesn't work and she is so passionate about this idea that she is, feels that this is her life's purpose. So she concentrates all her time on changing the world, basically. Mm -hmm. So the book is about 20 different experiences of different people who've been transformed by their experiences and those transformations can be on an individual level or they can be on a, a bigger scale like what Kelly is doing with her work. Mm -hmm. So it's something that really fascinates me mm -hmm. and I think, you know, if you look at the way people are transformed, it's about uh, being more positive to others, having greater altruism, having these positive feelings and I think those are all conducive to our evolution as well. In your book you describe an experience of yours uh, where you witnessed a patient who's been talking, a dying patient who's been talking to his mother the whole night. So you also looked into end-of-life phenomena. Yes, visions people have. that's right and I think if you talk to nurses most nurses ha have witnessed this kind of phenomena. Now it was new to me when I was a student nurse and I can remember my very first day on the ward and we were sitting in having the handover. The night nurse just casually said, oh, the man in bed six, section C, he'll be dead by the end of the morning because he's been talking to his dead mother since three o'clock this morning. And I thought that they were saying that to kind of spook me or to wind me up because it was my first day. And I looked around the office and the other nurses carried on writing as if it was perfectly normal. So at the end of the report, I went out to this patient's bedside and I could see him gesturing to someone and smiling and talking to someone I couldn't see. And throughout the course of the morning, I was concerned with other nursing duties, but I came back and forth and I witnessed this man talking to someone. And then it was about half past 11 in the morning and he then suddenly got energy from somewhere and he tried to sit up from bed and his arms were like this as if he was out trying to hold someone or hug someone and he had a beautiful smile on his face and that lasted probably about 30 seconds and then he just relaxed he would lay back in the bed and it looked like he'd gone to sleep but he actually died at that point and that is something that really kind of stuck with me then because as that night nurse had predicted he did die by the end of the morning and he'd been conversing with people who we couldn't see mm -hmm. and then as my nursing career progressed I witnessed it more and more so I probably paid more attention because of uh, my first day on the ward but I witnessed it quite um, quite a lot and indeed I reflected back to the time when my grandfather was dying and I can remember he was at home when he died and he used to point at the door and he'd say who look who's there mm -hmm. and um, I hadn't begun my nursing, uh, my research at that point, so I wasn't interested and I kind of ignored it and I never questioned it. And I know my grandmother, she was very spooked by that and um, she used to leave the room because it upset her so much. So I think a lot of people in the days before they die tend to have these visions where they see people. And sometimes they see people in their visions who they didn't know to be dead at the time of their experience as well. And that is really quite interesting to me because in my hospital research, one of the patients, again, it was on a night shift, his condition had deteriorated very rapidly during the night. We called his family in about three o'clock in the morning and they sat at the bedside and his condition stabilised. And the family were used to coming in because the patient was so unstable. And they said, look, we can see he's stable again now. We're very tired. We're going to go home and we'll come back in the morning. So off they went. And then shortly after the family left the bedside, he kind of regained consciousness again. And he was communicating with someone. And my colleague drew my attention to it. And she said, look at him. And he had this lovely smile on his face. And he was going, what are you doing here? And he was talking to someone and he just looked really happy. And this went on for about half an hour. So it was myself and about three or four of my colleagues witnessed this. Mm -hmm. Now, when his family returned in the morning, he said to them, you'll never guess who came to visit me in the night. 
He said my grandmother was there, my mother was there, and he said my sister. Now what was she doing with them? And he was very lucid at that time, yeah. not confused? Not at all. He was totally lucid and he was talking with his family. And, um, you know, his grandmother and his mother had died, but he didn't know that his sister had actually died the week before, but the family hadn't told him because they didn't want to upset him and they didn't want to set back his recovery. So that man picked up on his sister being dead when um, he didn't know that she was. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting to me as well, you know. Yeah. How do we know this is not just a hallucination, which is what doctors and nurses often think? Yeah, and perhaps we've been too used to just calling them hallucinations because we've never, described, uh, you know, investigated them in depth. But when you look at patients who've come up with and, you know, met people who they didn't know to be dead at the time and they all consistently report very similar things and so they have that comforting effect. So maybe we're just too hasty in calling them hallucinations mm -hmm. and I think we need to continue doing more research into this field as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the value of this research for society as a whole? Well, I think it gives us that different perspective on death because you think of how many patients have never thought about their own death, they've never considered their own mortality, and very often patients are very frightened at the end of their life as well. I've nursed lots of people who are confronted with their imminent death and they're really scared and frightened. And that's highlighted by the case of one of my patients who I describe in my book. Um, she was told that there was nothing that they could offer her. They, she couldn't have surgery. There was nothing that they could do to help and that she would die. And she was really distraught. She was really frightened. She was upset. And I didn't know what, how best I could mm -hmm. alleviate her, her anguish. So I sat with her and I said, look, I've done some research and I've spoken to patients who have died temporarily and come back to life. And they described quite pleasant experiences. If you would like me to discuss this further, a little bit later on today, let me know. And then about three or four hours later, she started to calm down a bit. And she said, would you talk to me about your research? She said, I I'd like to learn more about it. And she called her family and she said, will you tell my family as well? So I sat with the family and the patient and I said about my my, the near-death experiences and patients I'd interviewed and I said about what they'd described and I talked about deathbed visions and that really seemed to calm that lady down and it gave her some sort of comfort as well and also her family. So she was really grateful that I'd discussed that with her and I could see a very big difference in her condition when I left to a few hours before when she was very, very frightened and fearful. So I think if we look at these, um, we can help and empower a lot of patients who are afraid as well. Have you had experience with patients who committed suicide or tried to commit suicide? Well, it shows that actually um, people who have had multiple attempts at suicide, if they have a near-death experience, it tends to put them off any further attempts of suicide as well. So it gives them, a, again, a different experience, a different understanding of their problems. And some people realize that they take their problems wherever they go. So attempting suicide isn't the solution. And in fact, my co-author for my, my new book, The Transformative Power of um, Near-Death Experiences, Kelly Walsh, she tried to take her own life. She took a massive dose of paracetamol and it was when she was recovering on the psychiatric ward that she underwent this very deeply spiritual experience and that has completely transformed her life. And she realizes that suicide was not the answer. And one of, part, one of her missions really is to help people who are feeling suicidal to see things from a different perspective. So, and I think if you look in America as well, there's quite a few therapists who use cases of people who've had a near-death experience as part of their therapy. So they encourage their, their clients to, to look up cases of near-death experiences and read about them in a, in a way to um, kind of change their mindset as well. And it's been proven to be very successful in some cases. Can you talk with every client about near-death experiences or is there a resistance? I think it, 
Oh, I don't know. It could be some resistance. There. I don't know. I think it would be up to the individual therapist, really, as to whether they felt it was appropriate. But the pe certainly the therapists who have kind of used this sort of therapy have um, felt it to be very beneficial. Have you also heard about hellish experiences during a near-death experience? Um, in my research as well, I came across two patients who'd had distressing kind of experiences. So the first experience I came across was a lady who had an experience that was the you kind of the usual near-death experience, but she'd interpreted it in a very unpleasant or distressing way. So this lady felt that she had uh, left her body. She was looking down on her body in the chair. And then she felt that she was drifting towards a large expanse of water. She could see a bridge in the distance and she could feel herself getting closer and closer to this big river running underneath the bridge. And she said, I'm terrified of water. I don't swim and I'm really frightened of water. And the closer I was getting to this bridge, the more distressed and anxious I was getting. And I could hear these voices and it was as if there were, there were people laughing at me and mocking me. And she said it was horrible, it was terrifying. And she said, I got close to this river and all of a sudden it stopped. And I woke up in the hospital bed in intensive care, convinced that I died and I didn't know what had happened to me. So that was the first kind of distressing experience I came across. And the second kind I came across was a lady who'd had a cardiac arrest on the ward. And she remembers seeing, again, a large expanse of water. But on this water, there was a lady in a rowing boat and she had a straw hat on her head. She didn't recognize this lady, but she knew that she had to get away from her. And she said, I started getting really quite distressed. And then she could see some bright lights behind her, like fireworks, you know, Catherine wheels on a firework that spin around. And she said, these, these bright colors were spinning around very, very fast. And she said, and then I could see the mist. And she said, the, the smoke was there. And then I could feel the heat from the flames of hell. And she started to get very distressed and started crying. And she said, I was looking into hell. I was looking at the flames of hell. And she said, and she started crying hysterically. And at that point, she was so distressed. I had to terminate the interview because she was so frightened. So I said, okay, I, I said, we'll stop there. And she, she started to say, please, please, she wanted reassurance. She said, please tell me I'm not going to go to hell. Please tell me I'm not going to hell. So the only thing I could do to reassure her was to say that there are some cases described in the literature that have turned into a very pleasant experience. So they've started off distressing, but then when the person relaxes into the experience, it's turned into a pleasant experience. But one thing as well that I, um, I remember when I was a student nurse, there was a lady on the ward and it really sticks in my mind very vividly because she was in bed and she was terrified. She knew she was dying and she was terrified about death. She was literally, you could see it in her eyes. They had that really frightened look. Every time someone went past her bedside, the nurses, she would grab hold of them and she would grab onto their skin. She would dig their nail, her nails into their skin and she would say, please, please don't let me die. And we didn't understand why. And so we discussed with her family. We said, you know, she's, and she kept saying, I've died before. And it was a horrible experience. And um, we, we had a chat with her family and we said, why is your mother so distressed? Do you know? And she's, they said, well, she did have a cardiac arrest about five years ago. And on reflection now, having done that research, I'm wondering if this lady had a hellish type of experience which made her terrified of dying. And the only way that we could stop this lady from being distressed and being a danger to herself was to sedate her at the end of her life. So I think it's really important that we look at these experiences in more depth and we investigate the, the distressing experiences as well as the pleasant experiences so that we can help patients again at their en the end of their life. So um, it's something, in, unfortunately, these hellish experiences, don't, they don't get paid much attention, mm -hmm. but I think it's very important that we do. Do you think there's a connection between the way somebody thinks and the kind of near-death experience they have.
Yeah, now at the moment we don't really understand why some people have the pleasant experiences and others have the hellish experience. So there's been sort of lots of suggestions about it. Is it because of the, the person who has that hellish experience is used to being in control of their life? and they're afraid of rel relinquishing the ego but then when they do relax into it it turns into that pleasant experience so is it about letting go of control is it to do with their religious upbringing as well has it been kind of conditioned into their thinking by their religion that if they behave in a certain way that they will go to hell at the end of their life is it things like that um, and then there is one um, one researcher has suggested, uh, Professor Christopher Bash, he's um, written in his book Dark Night Early Soul, uh, Dark Night Early Dawn. Um, is it something to do with the collective unconscious? Are people tapping into the collective unconscious, but the un collective unconscious of the whole of mankind? And so they're having that distressing kind of experience rather than a personal experience. What they've tapped into is the whole of mankind. Uh, that collective unconscious. So there's lots of different kind of possibilities, but I think we need to explore them in a lot more depth. How is this research received in the medical profession? Yes, well, that's interesting because in the beginning, when I first started my research, I had a lot of kind of um, jokes made about my research. Um, and people didn't really take it that seriously. But as the, re as the research progressed, people did, they could see the value in it. They knew it was going to benefit patient care. And especially the doctors I worked with were, were very supportive and they wanted to know more about it. And then they invited me to discussions that they were having when they were making policies on end of life care. So they could see it was going to directly benefit patients. So I think what it did was open the minds of my colleagues as well. And they really did take it on board. So we were very lucky, you know, and I think it, it was really they they wanted to provide the best care for patients that they could as well. So I think we need to do that on a on a larger scale. Was this just locally? Yes, that's it. So it was local to where I was and that was one of the reasons why I left nursing because I felt I'd done this, this research, I had all this knowledge and I wanted to put it to use on a wider scale. And so if I can get the message out there to more and more people, I think it can really help a lot of people at the end of life. As a GP, I often see patients and their relatives, and I've noticed that frequently the family hasn't discussed death with a dying person. What's your view on this? Should we encourage discussing and talking about death with patients? Yeah, I think we should encourage people. Now I can draw on my personal experience from that, and I can also draw on experience of being an intensive care nurse. I can remember, for, I'll start off with um, an experience of one of the patients. She knew she was dying and she had accepted that fact that she was dying, but her family didn't and they were very death denying and they didn't want to discuss it. But the, the patient really did. She wanted to discuss it with their family. And for example, she had rings and she wanted to give her rings to different ones of her da different daughters that she had. But every time she tried to explain this to the family, they were saying, no, ma'am, don't be silly now, you're not going to die, you're not going to die. So in the end, that patient gave up trying to say, look, I want this daughter to have this ring. And that, that patient, I think, died in perhaps a little, a slightly frustrated way because she didn't, her wishes weren't seen through sort of thing. So that was one thing that made me think a lot. Um, and from a personal perspective, I can remember when my, my grandfather, my first grandfather, he was diagnosed with a brain tumour and my grandmother didn't want the doctors to tell him his diagnosis. And she, she was adamant, there's no way you can tell him. So they, they didn't tell him in those days, it was a very long time ago and things have changed since then. So they didn't tell him, but he knew he wasn't a stupid man and he knew from our body language and from our non-verbals that he knew that he had a brain tumour, he wasn't stupid. And so we never then had that opportunity to discuss his wishes at the end of his life. It was always something, no, you're not going to die, you're going to get better. But then, so that was quite frustrating for me because I wanted to say so much to my grandfather, but I didn't have that opportunity to say it. And equally, he didn't get that opportunity to hear it and say whatever he wanted to say. So then 
years later then my other grandfather he died and in the years in the months leading up to his death he was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer but he knew about my research and he knew about his diagnosis and we had long conversations about what I'd found out with my research and he really enjoyed talking to me about it because it, again it alleviated some of his anxieties around death and he had a really peaceful and calm death as well so I think the more open we are about death and the more we discuss it it seems that we can um, we can unfinished business we can we can you know address any unfinished business any things that we want to say we we have that opportunity to say it when we talk about death as well and sometimes you know during my nursing career as patients have been dying some patients do die in quite in spiritual distress and sometimes that is kind of mistaken for pain and it's not physical pain as such it can be spiritual anxious uh, anguish where there are things that they haven't said or they haven't cleared their conscience about so i think sometimes we need to address those things that are still on in the back of our minds so that patients can have that peaceful transition into death as well you left nursing now what do you do to communicate your insights and your experiences well one of the things that i've done is to write my book um, uh, and the other books that I've written so that's the biggest thing really um, I do a lot of interviews and I also work at the university and I work at the adult education department at Swansea University and I teach um, courses there's two modules that I teach one is called science spirituality and health and the other one is called exploring the mind and consciousness mm -hmm. and so what I look at is the role of emotions in health I look at what is the mind is it just the brain or is it more than the brain so we look at all kinds of possibilities and we look at things like spiritual emergence and spiritual emergency so when people go through a spiritual crisis or the dark night of the, of the soul and they can become very depressed but sometimes if they're able to work through it they become in the long run much more positive and they get through it and they're actually they gain great wisdom through going through that process mm -hmm. and so we look at all different things like that mm -hmm. so um, it's something that really is fascinating to me and what I found with the students that I teach it's also fascinating for the students and in fact some of my students at the end of the, the module that I taught they said to me gosh I feel like a different person through learning about this and I said well is it just the fact that you're studying now and and that you've um, started doing a, a part-time degree that it's giving you different skills and they said no it's it's this particular module in itself it's made them think in a very different way that has really empowered them in a great in 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 a way they didn't think possible mm -hmm. so as a result of doing my course they've asked if I can I can extend the courses and do more modules at a higher level as well so that's a possibility that I'm hoping I'll be able to develop in the future. What kind of students are they? Uh, they're adult learners and they're le they've um, just enrolled on the part-time degree. So they're from all walks of life. Some of them might be young mums with, um, with young children. Some of them might be people who have retired who just want to go back and study again. Some people are working and they want to get an extra qualification to support their work and progress in their career. So you get all kinds of adult learners and it's great because the students have got such a, a wealth of life experience so I learn a great deal from my students as well so it's it's really great I love teaching them so that's going well it is yes mm -hmm. Penny thank you very much for your time and for your experiences and I wish you all the best for your future work oh thank you it's been a pleasure thank you, thank you very much.